association with the Women in Games Special Interest Group, and uh, I would like to invite our panelists onto the stage. Uh, please welcome Kate Edwards, CEO of Geography and uh, former executive director of IGDA. Kate is also a geographer, writer, and a corporate strategist. Uh, I would like to invite our second panelist, Julian Widders, VP of Natural Motion, an executive coach and leadership, culture, and management consultant. I would like to invite our third panelist, Kanan Rai, Manager of Business Development of Google Play. Kanan has been working towards building and growing the Android ecosystem in the region and works with a lot of startups across India and the globe. I'm Purnima Sitaraman, co-founder of Namalore Entertainment. Uh, we are a storytelling company that makes socio-cultural impact games, and I'll be your moderator for today. Thank you. Uh, so we're going to get started with what is the definition of inclusivity, because that's what our panel is. So, uh, Kate, would you like to take that? So, what is, what is inclusivity? So to me, um, inclusivity basically means that you are, have the broadest mind when you approach the creative process. So you are not so locked into your singular vision of how something gets made, that you're willing to entertain the opinions of others, including people on your own team, um, but more importantly, it's like the creative vision and the world that you're creating, you're open to hearing from other people about, you know, maybe there's something in the, in, in the creative process that is not appropriate or it might be stereotyped or it might be uh, exclusive to a certain group. And so you're willing to hear somebody out and say, okay, I'm willing to change it or maybe at least to listen to the opinion. And um, so I, could, I guess I would say it's more of an open-mindedness. Julian, would you like to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm learning that Kate says everything uh, I want to say, but better. Um, so all of that, um, I, I guess how we think about inclusivity is harnessing the power of the collective mind. And I've only really thought about that as you, as you were talking just then. By the collective mind is every voice that you can bring in that represents as diverse a cognitive function as possible. People with different backgrounds, but ways of thinking, ways of bringing themselves into the world, and that they know categorically that they will have the opportunity to contribute and to talk at the table that you've created and within the space that you're creating for creativity to happen and thinking to happen. And it's a little bit of what we touched on yesterday when we talked about the thinking environment, knowing that without exception, if you've got a month of experience, 10 years, 20 years of experience, whether you're an artist, whether you're the son of an artist, the daughter of one of the engineers, you can have a voice at the table that will inflect and change the nature of thinking that happens in the moment. And I think when we create that thinking environment, we create an inclusive environment. Um, obviously, I agree with what they said, but I think to one, one of the things mentioned was stereotypes. I think that defines a lot of what we do, right? Uh, if I come from a really good MBA school, do I only want to hire MBAs or do I give them more opportunity than the, than the others? So for me, inclusivity is going beyond what my comfort zone is, um, not only in terms of hiring um, and growth opportunities, but also in terms of ideas on the table, uh, the kind of games I'm making, what do they represent? Are they targeting women or just men? What kind of characters are in there? So going just beyond the obvious making sure you're including people that are outside your comfort zone and comfort ideas. So my next question is, uh, have you experienced or observed any inclusivity issues in your career? And Julian, would you like to take that? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's a really interesting one to ask a, a kind of middle-class male from the United Kingdom, because really, from, a, from an obvious perspective, of, of course not. You know, I'm in an enormously privileged group. Um, and anything that I could offer that would say, oh, yeah, actually, you know, I experienced um, some, some exclusion in my life, pales into insignificance, fate, you know, when you put it in, in comparison to the challenges and the enormous hills people have climbed to create a genuinely inclusive industry. Um, and we know we're all still on that journey. The reality is, though, certainly early on in my career, going back 22 years, in the provinces of the United Kingdom, it was predominantly a white uh, male industry. I mean, it really was. And so, you know, People have come through an environment that, you know, ultimately is biased towards that sector. And today, to be at Natural Motion and to be part of a team that's 50%, we were chatting earlier, 50% non-white British, um, that has people from 15 countries on planet Earth, that has representatives from every continent. And, you know, I joke about Antarctica, but we had this, this real, really big drama at the end of 16 where we realized it's impossible to hire someone from Antarctica. So we sponsored a penguin. 
And so we now have a sponsored penguin who's our team mascot from Antarctica, uh, who we've nicknamed Papa Viz. Um, so we now represent every continent on planet Earth, and we're really, really proud of that. So there's a lot of work we've got left to do, um, you know, but I think we're, we're going in the right direction for sure. So personally, I think, again, I've been very privileged to not have faced discrimination. Uh, but I do have some interesting stories. So I think discrimination or exclusion is not limited to my work. You know, because I'm in a client-facing role, I speak to a lot of people. So I've been in Google over 10 years, and before this, I used to work on the ad monetization side. Uh, and I used to travel quite a bit and speak to different independent developers. Um, they might be one-person team or a hundred-person team, and what I would find was very often these were engineers who were not uh, very well-versed with the business side of things. I were not used to talking to a lot of people outside. So I could have a one-hour conversation with this guy who was running a multi-million dollar business in a small town in India, and he would not look at me because he didn't know how to speak to a woman, and it was really odd. And here I was giving him advice, and he was taking notes, but it was all like this, and he would nod, and he would never look up. So, I mean, it's funny and interesting, but, you know, it's also important to look at it from the other side, right, that if somebody is not being able to look at you, what kind of culture is he being brought up in? What are his parents teaching him? Um, and then the second is when you're talking about inclusion, again, moving outside the workspace to a country like India, right? Um, the ratio is not exactly equal. It's just 48.5% of the population is women. Um, only 66% of the women are actually educated compared to the 82% men. Um, and workforce is obviously much lower. So when you look at global averages, I think globally 55% of women are uh, uh, employed in the work workforce. And for men, I think it's closer to 82%. Uh, but in India, it's 27% women, which is much lower, and 79% uh, women, uh, men. So the disparity is so high. So it's, it's not only a question about what's happening in my team and my organization uh, and my state, but also the country. So what are we doing as a country to make sure this is being addressed? We haven't even touched the third gender, right? I mean, Absolutely. It's a whole other discussion. And Kate? Yeah, I mean, throughout my, my history in the game industry, I've been in the industry for 25 years, and I've seen a lot. Um, I've had issues happen to myself. I've seen a lot of injustices, as I would call them, to other people. Um, I was at Microsoft for 13 years. I saw a lot of bad stuff happen there. I mean, I was there from 92 to 05, and so the 90s were not necessarily a progressive decade in terms of corporate culture. I mean, we were only just then starting to get the idea of what diversity means, and um, so it was challenging. I saw a lot of people, underrepresented people, get passed over for promotion. Um, I myself, I think I was very fortunate in that the job that I do was very weird. Um, being a geographer in a tech company, doing culturalization work. The, the, the advantage I had in a certain way is that kind of work is so bizarre is that it kind of shielded me to a certain degree because people feared what I would say. And what I mean by that is that because my job was to advise on the political and cultural risks in, their, in the products they're making, they feared what I might say, because if I say something, I can escalate it straight to Bill Gates and give him a lot of problems for them. So, so they kind of backed off a little bit. So I didn't really get that as much, but I certainly had times where my opinion was not being listened to, uh, like in a room of men, and like I would chime in. Um, one, one event was, one thing that was pretty funny is that I was in an event recently, well, it was about two years ago, so I, was, I got on an elevator. There's all these tech bros in their khakis and their blue shirts, and they're in the elevator. They're talking about something around AR. I wrote my master's thesis on AR and VR in 1991, so I know a little bit about it. So I, I chimed in, and I, I, so I interrupted. Well, they kind of, and they all kind of looked at me for a second, and then they just start talking. They didn't even acknowledge me. Well, the great thing, though, is the elevator got to the floor, the door opened up, and this person comes rushing up to me saying, hey, where have you been? You're, you know, you've got to get on stage, because I was the keynote speaker, and these guys were going into my talk. <laughs> so so they, they heard this person say that to me, and I gave them a sideward glance that basically said, screw you. And then during the talk, I, I found them in the audience before I started talking. So every once in a while, I'd like look down at them down there and kind of... Kind of, you know, but um, 
but yeah, well, and probably just, I'm sorry, I'm going on too long, but the, probably the worst case of the, where inclusion and diversity had an issue with me was when I ran the IGDA for five years and I was running it during Gamergate. So, I mean, I was being daily attacked, death threats and harassment just because of my gender, you know, because in, well, because I was also speaking out against them, but. Would you say that there's a bro culture, and I know Riot and a few other companies have been taking the heat uh, for having a very uh, bro culture within the game development environment. So would you like to talk about that as well? Yeah, just, I mean, I'll just speak briefly. But I, yeah, I mean, there, that certainly has been an issue. I mean, it's not just obviously in games. It's in a lot of tech companies. And it's actually in any company where you have majority of one certain group, um, you, you tend to have that culture dominate. Um, just like conversely, I've heard from men who are in mostly women only companies, which, you know, are in different industries, but they will say, I feel uncomfortable here, which I'm like, good, but, um, <laughs> you should, but, um, but it works both ways. And I mean, but off obviously in the tech world, it's more about a, a male dominated environment and it, it is really challenging, especially because, um, I think we live in an era where women have to be very brave um, to be willing to be that first per first woman to be in that job or first person of color even because oftentimes especially with, with with underrepresented groups they're not willing to join a company unless there's somebody who looks like them in the company already and so you have to kind of be in this pioneer mode and be willing to kind of take a lot of crap for being that first person so uh, what do you believe are the biggest hindrances? Because this is not just uh, gender disparity that we're talking about. There's pay disparity, there's role disparity, leadership disparity. So uh, what do you believe are these hindrances? So, Yeah, I mean, it, we're really lucky. I mean, really lucky in natural motion. We don't have role or pay disparity uh, within the racing business. Um, we've been systematic and, and you know very deliberate actually to make sure that, that cannot take hold and does not exist and so within leadership roles within our business um, our live operations team is uh, run by a woman producer uh, our feature development is run by a woman producer uh, data science is run by a lady um, but nevertheless there is a gender imbalance for sure um, it's proven hard to date to find as many female engineers as we would like I mean that's a really really tough hill for us to climb at the moment um, but very much a focus for us is working out how to make ourselves a more attractive place for the female engineers and industry to come to. You know, one of the things that we're looking at and have been looking at now for a number of months is the way we write job descriptions because there's been such a great body of work about what attracts um, female talent to a role compared to male. And if we put this extensive skill set, you know, we know that actually female candidates tend to say, well, I don't have all of that and therefore I'm not appropriate for the role. Whereas an equivalent male of the same skills and capability will go, I can do most of that. And the other bits, I can, you know, I can, I can do on the job. And so we're really looking at how we make sure that at every element of our, uh, of our pipeline, we create specifications that are appropriate for, for all genders and actually all, um, all types of thinkers uh, to come to our business. And also that the environment itself is attractive for everybody. Um, would you like to add to that? I think the biggest hindrance is rigid ideology where you're not willing to open up. Um, like it's really sad when you see women in the workforce at an early age and they get married, have babies and that's it, they're out, right? Um, you announce you're pregnant and you get fired. Like these are th basic things we need to deal with. It doesn't matter how great she's been or what kind of job she's been doing. Um, and, you know, I think the more we talk about it, the more we try to sort of tackle these issues. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's, well, where to start? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's been a lot of issues around this. I mean, we see better examples every once in a while. Um, we see companies trying to do the right thing these days. Um, you know, I think a lot of it has to do with you find a leader, you know, that's, that's part of it is that you, you have companies that lack thought leadership. They lack, well, frankly, bravery because it takes a certain amount of courage to step up and do these sort of things. And, um, you know, just one example that I, that I heard about recently, earlier this year, there was a company in Sweden who um, the, the executives in the company, um, they suspected, well, they, they saw a talk that, and they heard about the issue of the gender wage gap. And um, so they were honest with themselves. They said, well, I, I wonder if we have an, a wage gap. Well, but they actually took the chance to investigate, so they did. So they found out, yeah, we actually do. They, so they, first of all, they took action um, based on just hearing a talk at a conference, 
And so once they found out that there was evidence that they had a gender wage gap, they gave the issue to, they basically told HR, fix this. We want this to be fixed. We don't want there to be a gap. We want all the wages to be normalized across all the job functions in the company. So they took about three months to do it. And then on one day, they flipped a switch and said, on this day, everyone's salary is adjusted. And so, yes, some people saw a slight decrease, but many people saw a tremendous increase, and most of those people were women. And there was one case where this woman, she saw a 70-70% increase in her salary. And she almost quit the company because she was so pissed off that they undervalued her skill for that long. You know, but she did, she did decide to stay because she just felt like, well, at least they're trying to do the right thing, and she's making a lot more money now. So... But it just, it's, it's oftentimes just a matter of will. You just have to decide to do it. If, if I can just add to that, I think just look at how many people were involved in that, right? People who spoke up, talk about their salary, this is what I'm getting paid. People who were able to identify and speak up, that's a really tough thing to do. Go to the HR and say, I see this happening, this is not okay, you're going to fix it or not. And HR, who actually worked with them to fix the issue, and then the leadership who said, okay, let's do this. So everyone has to come together to make this happen. And uh, I've also noticed that when we try to be inclusive and uh, a lot of them will say it's like a statement, it's a fad, it'll go away. So uh, we have to explain to them what is the purpose of being inclusive, what is the advantages, what does it give to us. So would you like to get started on that, Kit? Okay. <laughs> so um, my view, why, why is inclusivity matter? Because ultimately you're trying to make a better product. You're trying to have a better outcome for what you're actually doing in your work, whether it's creating software, creating a game, whatever it might be. Um, you know, to give a quick anecdote, um, there's a producer at Disney, her name is Christina Reed. And so she was producer on the movie Big Hero 6, which you may have seen. And she also did two shorts called Paper Man and Feast. And so she did those three projects as a, as a producer at Disney and she won an Oscar for all three of those. So that's not a bad track record. And she attributed her success to a very inclusive process that they implemented in the company on these projects. So what they did is that when, you know, in the filmmaking process, they would have dailies. So they look at like the, the production footage of the animation and they would kind of see where are we and they'd have everybody look at it. Well, what they did is they invited everybody from the building, from the entire company into the room, the cleaning people, the security guards, the catering staff, everybody was invited into the room and they said, when you're in this room, everyone's voice is equal here. And so what they did is they would show the footage and then they would just say, okay, what do you think? And people would just shout out ideas saying, well, I think that character should do this instead. Or I think you should have them do this. And she said they got so many incredible ideas from so many different people, older people, younger people, people of color, pe women, all these different people who were just shouting out ideas. And they said during their creative meetings of the core creative team, they never thought of, of most of the stuff that was being suggested to them. And so she did that on all three of these projects and she attributes that like complete open inclusive environment to the success of those three projects. I mean, you know, getting an Oscar is pretty much the, the highest success you can get in her field. And so just being open to all of these different opinions and not judging those opinions. And then it, then it was up to the creative team to make, make the decisions on what pieces are actually gonna work. Julia? Um, I, I mean, that anecdote's amazing. You know, I absolutely love it because it speaks to the power of the collective mind and how important it is to get the collective mind thinking on the problems that we face. Um, I can't top it. I mean, it's just so wonderfully inspiring. But when we think about the thinking environment and the sentiment that the lady who created the thinking environment, which I chatted about yesterday, Nancy Klein, um, really wanted to bring to it back in the 1970s this idea that all the thinkers you can bring around the table with diverse skill sets, diverse backgrounds, diverse ways of thinking and solving problems, all have something to contribute, but you need to make a deliberate effort for them to be known that they will be heard, they will be seen, they will have equal turns and attention compared to people around the table. And actually, the things that we can't see, right, introverts mm. versus extroverts, yes. which aren't obvious to us, is this person having a bad time, or are they just an introvert? And they need time to come up with the, mm -hmm. the ideas that, that they have to offer. They need longer to think and reflect than other people do. And if you take a systematic approach to that, if you're really deliberate, which is what your wonderful anecdote shows, just the most amazing things can happen, and both from a 
you know, if, we, if we're to be raw about it, from a product quality perspective, and I do attribute um, the success of our product, CSR2, to the fact we have that very deliberate approach to getting, we hope, the best thinking from everybody around the table in the meetings that we run. But also from a philosophical perspective, I mean, why wouldn't we want everybody who we pay and invite into our business, and they make a decision with their life and time and energy and effort to be present in our office, why don't we want to hear their voice mm -hmm. and allow them to be an equal part of the journey that we all go on and walk away going, you know, I made a difference, I did something special. Whether they've got a month or, or a year or 20 years experience, everybody's got something to offer that can shape and change the product. Mm -hmm. But that anecdote I'm going to take away and synthesize somehow mm -hmm. into the work that we do because it, it's a wonderful example of mm -hmm. that at play, at scale. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that was a really inspiring story, so thank you for sharing uh, and completely agree with all the points you make. I, I think very little I can add to that, but just speak up, right? If you see something that you don't think is right or you think you're not being heard or your person next to you is not being heard, speak up and try and try again. So is there any parameter that we can use to assess? Because inclusivity varies. In some cases, it's just gender. In some cases, it's ethnicity. Uh, it keeps varying. So in how, in what context can we assess these parameters? So Julian, would you like to take it? Yeah, I mean, this, this, is a, this is a really interesting question actually, is what parameters can we use to assess inclusivity? And I think inclusivity is an approach, it's a behavior, it's a leadership style, it's a cultural style, it's a management style. And so because of that, and I, you know, I, we talked about it at the keynote yesterday, but also we've touched on it just now, I think it's something that's really easy to adopt. Obviously, diversity is somewhat different because then it's actually the outward manifestation of, um, of obvious characteristics. Um, and that's important because then, you know, for, particularly for global audiences, having representatives of the global audience around the table able to speak about the macro cultures they come from and indeed the micro cultures that your games represent is important. But underneath that, there's all sorts of things we can't see. You know, we can't see orientation. We can't see how they present themselves in the world from a, from a gender perspective. It's not always um, as obvious as we might want to call out. And nor are people's backgrounds obvious. Actually, it's really easy if we just take what we see at face value that we make judgment calls that are wildly incorrect, wildly incorrect. There's all sorts of things going on. People who are depressed, people who've got ADHD, ADD, and all sorts of other different ways of thinking about the world that are actually, when applied to a problem, remarkably powerful. And so we talk about diversity and that is important, but actually inclusivity is, I think, a systematic approach to welcoming all voices and all people to the table, regardless of any other characteristic. Um, so yeah. Alan? I don't think there's a mathematical formula. It's not easy to measure something like inclusivity, but I think we're privileged being in the creative space. You know, we spoke about how you express yourself and being creative. I think the product of our work, be it games or animation or something else, can easily com communicate those things. So e how you handle things at an organization level is one, and I think Juliet spoke about that, but are you being inclusive in your games? Um, are you representing everyone from different orientations, different backgrounds, different gender, different age, um, and are you targeting them such that there are different kind of gamers coming to, your, to play your games. And that, that is, again, something that can be measured. Just today, I was going through LinkedIn, and I saw this really great artwork of an African-American boy with an amputated leg. And he was going to be in a shooting game. And I thought that was really cool, right? Uh, PUBG is a global phenomenon. We're talking so much about it. But I really like that there's equal number of men and women in the game. It's not just. Uh, a male shooting game, and you know we see women. A lot of women are playing it as well. So I think that's really great to see, um, and it's imp it's important to actively think about these things uh, as we're building different games or movies and things like that. Okay. I think the only comment I would say on this is that just to speak to the leadership. Um, the way I view it is that, I mean, to me, games are a collaboratively creative form of interactive art. That's, what, that's how I would define a video game. And as such, taking upon the word collaborative, that means you are usually working with a team. It's very rare that you've got one person doing everything. It does happen, but it's rare to have all of that talent in one person. So you are working with other people. And if you're in a leadership role, like if you're the lead producer or the head of the company or whatever you want to 
whatever role that might be. I personally feel that leadership means service. You are there to service the needs of the people that report to you. You are there to service the goals and the needs of the product that you're developing and the, and the outcome of the game. So rather than being like an overlord or a king or whatever you think you might be, what you really are is a servant. And so your job is to make sure that the, mo that the best interest of that product and of the vision of that that creative outcome is served, which means you have to be open to those opinions and you have to set the tone that the ultimate outcome of what we're creating is going to be the is going to be the outcome of all of us. It's not just me getting the credit for it because I'm like the public person. It's like my I'm I'm only representing a great group of people, you know, that I'm serving for their benefit. I mean that I think that attitude not only would serve to make our content more inclusive and our teams more inclusive, but I do think it would basically set a much better tone on a lot of things in our industry, like in terms of how you treat your employees and how you, you know, treat their work-life balance and all these other things. That's another thing, a work-life balance, which is very hard to find. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know a lot of senior management who are not really happy about work-life balances. <laughs> so. Uh, so how do we encourage inclusivity? Like, what steps can we take? We definitely know there is a gap and how do we, what do we do as a industry to contribute and reduce that gap? So, uh, get. Well, I, I think the first thing, and we've kind of touched upon this already, is, is that it has to start with management being honest with themselves. They have to be, look in the mirror and just be really brutally honest with yourself. You know, am I running the company the way it should be run? Uh, am I listening to my employees? It, are the best interests of this game being served? Um, or am I just doing it for my own ego? You know, and, and so having that honest conversation is really difficult to do, but it's very necessary. And if you don't think that your leadership, if you're not in a leadership role, then you need to hold the leadership accountable. So you need to be the one asking them those questions. And that can be very difficult to do. And so some people don't do it because they're afraid of being fired or, you know, having a demotion or something. But it does take a certain level of bravery and courage to step up and say, I'm trying, I'm, the reason I'm bringing this up is for the best interest of the company and the best interest of our game and the final product. And so I think that is a fundamental step that has to happen. Um, and because really nothing else is going to happen unless the leadership is on board and agrees that it needs to happen. Okay. Um, I think the first step is just right here. The people who are in the room means you care about inclusivity, and I think that's a great first step, so thank you for caring about it. Um, the second is, what do you do after you go back home? Are you going to change things? Are you going to think about things more deeply? Um, I think the most important thing is just being more aware and then doing something about it. Like, women are less likely to ask for a pay hike or negotiate their salary. They just take what's given. Um, so if you are from a relatively more marginalized section or if you are in the minority, be conscious of whether you think something's happening against you or somebody else because of it, one. And second, what are you doing for it? Um, and I think a lot of people wait for things to pile up and then they just quit, which is not the best thing to do. You should speak up every time it happens. And you don't have to get aggressive. Just get into a room, have a have a frank conversation, chances are the other person doesn't even realize or they're not conscious of what's happening. So not only be aware, but try and make the other person aware, and I think just that can go a long way. Well put. Julian? Um, yeah, I mean, well, we, we've talked a lot about the thinking environment. I mean, you know, and, it, and it's easy to beat that same drum, but actually I'd really recommend people read Nancy's work because it's awe-inspiring. Um, she is, to this day, my hero. She's an amazing, amazing, amazing person. And it's such an incredible body of work that I can't recommend it enough because at the heart of it is this idea of inclusivity. Um, we chatted a little bit yesterday during the keynote about, but then how do you measure it? How do you actually know? Um, we use a, a web tool that asks a question every week about how happy people are at work. Are you recognized? Are you being heard? Uh, and over time, you build up a really clear picture of actually, are we succeeding? Really? It's an anonymous tool. People can choose to contribute or not contribute. Um, it's a very low friction, very quick question. It's now integrated into Slack. So the people get asked the question each week. They can very quickly respond. Uh, and it's a really great way to see, you know, to hold yourself to a truth mm. like it's mm -hmm. all well and good talking talking a good game and speaking to rhetoric it's another thing saying actually are we succeeding are we serving you
you in the right way. And Kate said it right, you know, leadership is about servant leadership. It's about recognizing that the paradox of leadership and seniority is it absolutely requires followership. People have to follow you. And these days, they're going to follow you if ultimately you try and get your ego out of the picture and they recognize that you're in it for their interests mm -hmm. and their interests only because ultimately, it's the people closest to content and closest to players who make the biggest difference. Yep. I think, I, I joked yesterday, but I did kind of mean it, leaders are frauds, right? We don't do the hard work. We get to stand up and like take credit for all sorts of things that we had nothing really to do with. And if we can get people you know, at the peripheries of our business who are the closest to our consumers mm -hmm. making amazing decisions regardless of any other characteristic then we win and so I think that's our ultimate expression and aspiration I think that brings us to the end of this and one of the reasons we are called we were calling it an inclusivity panel I think Kate and I discussed this is every time we get on board with women in games special interest group and talk about it it's always just concluded as that we just want only women representation what they don't see is that that is just one small piece of the problem and uh, which is one of the reasons we also wanted to call this an inclusivity panel and uh, I am really glad and we I hope at least to those who are present here we have clarified that this is not about just one gender it's it's about representation of an entire race altogether Absolutely. so thank you uh, and we are now open for Q&A so if anyone has any questions Hi, um, thank you for a very nice panel, first of all. Um, I wanted to ask something about communication. So uh, you're talking about like, getting everyone in your organization to, to be part of whatever you're doing. Um, and I have, faced, uh, ish, uh, I have faced problems with that because of people's different ability to communicate, people's different, I mean, people get told that you're allowed to communicate in different ways, that being gender or where you're from or, or what your background is. Uh, I found it, uh, I would also like to know from Julian because I, I worked in a, in a company that also went from being a very one, one language to being a global company where, where we had to kind of switch to another language and some, per, some people that was their mother tongue, some people might just have learned that language, right? So how do you, do you guys have any way of how we can expand communication to include more people? Like can we have other ways than just sitting in a meeting room and you know, talk about things or write things or, yeah. I hope you understand the question. Well, I, I mean, I, my view on that is that, I mean, we have to kind of what points that, that were brought up by the other panelists is that, for example, if you just take the one dynamic of extroverts versus introverts, extroverts love meetings. They'll say they don't, but they, they like to be in a room because they get energy from other people. That's what extroversion is. And so, you know, they will be in the room and they'll argue or whatever. And, and I think that's the problem. All these meetings are being created by extroverts because introverts would do anything to avoid a meeting. So, but the important thing is that you have to have different mechanisms for feedback and communication and you have to treat them all equally. So it's like if you go to a meeting and invite people to speak up, I mean, it, it happens. I'm an introvert myself. I remember those days. I'll speak up now because I kind of, I didn't get over it, but I kind of found a way to fake extroversion. But, um, you know, there's a lot of people who will never speak up and they've got brilliant ideas. And so you have to give them another mechanism for speaking up. Tell, they can do it in writing. They can do like you, like you mentioned, an anonymous survey, whatever they're, what, whatever you can do to have other mechanisms so people feel like they've got different channels through which they can communicate. But then of course on the other side of that, whoever is accepting all that feedback, they have to treat it equally. You know, and I know that is a bias that also happens in the workplace because we automatically tend to reward A-type people who are, are boisterous and vocal and they, you know, energetic, which tends to be extroverts. And we, we tend to ignore, not necessarily punish, but we tend to ignore people who are quiet. And it's just a bias that we, a lot of us have. And so we have to be very conscious of the bias and then we have to figure out how do we address it and give different avenues for feedback and then treat those avenues equally. I just would like to add to what she just mentioned. Uh, there is there's this one tool uh, I would recommend everyone in this room now that we're talking about it. 
which can you guys can bring to your companies in practice in culture uh, 15 5 that's what we have been practicing for almost three and a half years uh, every week we put down like four simple questions just to keep a pulse on what's happening around uh, most of the questions are two of them are repetitive like challenge and struggle those are always repetitive uh, or milestones you achieved that's another repetitive but besides that there's always something extra which we ask every week do you have feedback for leadership is are you doing enough for your role are you happy with your role so you can come up with all those new questions and that becomes a platform for introverts as well uh, extroverts as well people who speaks in meeting they get their point across people who couldn't this is a platform where they can uh, get their points across and everything gets consolidated that's also a platform where you can appreciate your colleagues that you've done a fantastic work on a small stuff or give high fives to each other I think that that's something which I would recommend most companies who are looking for this uh, kind of feedback mechanism thank you um, I think one thing that I've learned from is social gatherings in workplaces. So what that does is it removes that hierarchy where you can walk up to your boss's boss's boss and talk to him or her about a product idea you have or a design idea you have. Um, or, you know, it's, it's a more casual environment so you can learn more about people you work with and that strengthens the bond. Especially for me because I, you know, I work out of India and for us it's a remote location. But when we all get together in the head office, you know, I learn so much about my colleagues there. And that makes it easier when I come back home to ping them and ask them about something they're working on or share something I'm working on and easier ways to collaborate. And it does create a more inclusive environment because you learn more about people around you and appreciate them more in many ways. Um, well, I think part of the question was about the language barrier as well, uh, because we, we do have a lot of uh, people for whom English isn't their first language. Um, I've got to say, actually, the majority of people who we interview for whom English isn't their first language, on the whole, it doesn't sound like English isn't at least their first and a half language. Um, the level of fluency that we get within the gaming industry, I think, is generally remarkable, actually. Uh, so that's not proven to be a problem. I think more actually is the, the point Kate made about introvert, extrovert spectrum. And of course it is a spectrum, but uh, the people who are more biased towards reflection and then volunteering as little information as possible to make their point. Um, one of the things that we found even with the thinking environment and just very briefly actually, the structure of our meetings is people will come in and then formally in the structure, uh, we will ask an opening round question that's often quite silly, but it's designed to create an easeful space. Like if you were a drop of rain, whose shoulder would you fall on? Um, just to break the state that they've come into the room in and get them into a playful state, actually, and a more, a more reflective state. We do it very quickly. Um, sometimes it can go down the rabbit hole, which we try and break. Um, but, you know, you get around the table. And the thing is, if people talk within the first five minutes of being in a meeting, they are actually in the meeting and will contribute. If people don't talk in the first five minutes, they're probably not there. They're thinking about whatever else is going on outside in the studio. So it does that to begin with. What we endeavor to do is circulate the agenda before the meeting with each of the agenda points posed as a question. And the critical thing about that is, of course, if statements like close us down and make us go, well, I agree, I don't agree with that statement, questions ignite our thinking. And the point of doing that is that people have the opportunity to reflect and think before they come in. And so that if they need time to formulate their answers, and I haven't found that, generally speaking, to be a, a, a cultural thing. It's more of actually a, a, a cognitive thing. People just want time to formulate their answers. It gives them a chance to come in with something that they can contribute into that meeting. And then they know that the way the round is going to work is someone will go, well, I'll volunteer the first thought, and everyone then will successively take it in turns to answer the question without fear of interruption and knowing that they will be paid exquisite attention to with a curiosity from the room about what they're going to think next. And that's the structure that we follow. Um, and so far, we found it very effective at making sure that everyone does have a voice, whether English is their first language or otherwise. Um, hi, and I want to join the voices which thank you for this very important panel. Um, I have a comment and I have a question regarding this very important theme which you staged. I was actually shocked to the bone to see how small the audience for this panel was. 
the other people who just came in, I suppose most of you will want to join the next panel on eSports. For a large part of the session, we have been like, what, 15, 20 people? And that's a problem in a nutshell, very unfortunately. But I do have a question as well, and this regards um, inclusiveness in games, especially in India. So I do research games in India, produced in India, and um, I teach a lot um, to humanities students around the world, in Europe and in the US especially, and I always show small clips of examples. I usually use four examples, two of them have female protagonists. That's 50%, that's not a bad average, and in 90% of the times I get questions, why is that? How is India so advanced? Can anyone answer that? Um, so in India, unfortunately, majority of the gamers are male. Uh, in fact, we were looking at some YouTube trends the other day, um, and while gaming is picking up and you know, game streaming is also picking up, it actually falls under ma male lifestyle because it's the men who are tuning in and watching w gaming videos and playing games. Um, in fact, some of the developers I work with tried launching games targeted to women. The protagonist was female. Um, everything in their marketing strategy was targeting women, but they found to their surprise that most of their audience was actually male. It's simply because women are not playing. The other way to look at this is that in many households there's just one smartphone and that belongs to the male head. So it could be the husband or the father or the brother, and the woman might actually be taking the smartphone and playing, but we'll attribute it to the male. So I think there are many issues. The third problem, which is not specific to women in gaming, is just the stigma around gaming. Right? India's extremely social. We want to do everything together. People live together and talk together and eat together. So if you're in the corner playing a game by yourself, it's not cool at all. Um, but that changed with Ludo. So Ludo is a board game which translated to a huge success online. But that's because four people sit and play together. So the smartphone is actually a board game then. And you're sitting and playing together. And that was widely acceptable. Uh, same for PUBG, right? You're actually playing with your friends. And people get into groups of four and, hey, let's get online at 11 AM or 11 PM. And we're all going to play together. And then there's the voiceover, right? The voice chat that works very well. So you're not doing it alone anymore. You're doing it together in a group. So I think there is opportunity and there are problems. Um, depends on how you want to look at it, but definitely huge, op uh, he there are a lot of things that we can do uh, to overcome these problems. Oh, thanks so much. Thanks, Zinia. That was one of my passing remarks and you put that across as a question. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, guys. Uh, we will be wrapping up this panel and uh, thank you. Thank you, panelists. Thank you so much.